It's my pleasure to introduce Jack Cho. Um, uh, Jack is from the um, uh, School of Journalism C Communication at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, and he asked me to stress that he's not merely an academic, he's an activist. And in his own words, one sums it up with Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach, yeah? <laughs> which is, for those of you who small number of you who have forgotten that is um, uh, philosophers have only um, understood well the point is to change it. And uh, Jack's uh, published work um, uh, looks uh, very much at uh, the people who uh, produce the, uh, 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 the information technology and particularly in, in, in China. And uh, the title of his talk is the title of, of his uh, uh, latest, latest book, um, which is I Slave, Rethinking Smartphone Activism and Chinese Labour. So, over to you, Jack. Thank you. Okay, sure, sure, yes. Uh, thank you, Peter, for that introduction and for uh, University of Westminster, uh, all the organizers, uh, all the labor going into the events. Okay, thank you everyone for having me. My sharing today is based on my new book that Peter just talked about. It came out last November, in which I argue the abolition of digital slavery or I slavery is not only possible, it is a imperative duty. We have no choice but to take on. The key word here, I slave, was originally a slogan invented during a transnational campaign in 2010 by labor activists in Hong Kong and in Europe, which I picked up and fresh, uh, freshed out. The title is, therefore, a salute to those working on the front lines of digital labor activism, to their bravery and creativity. The subtitle of the book contains the word manifesto, which was something a lot bolder than the original idea I had when I started this book. However, I think it suits my goal pretty well because this project is, after all, about two provocations. First, digital media has done much more damage to the world and to humanity than most of us would like to realize. Second, we can and have to use the same technological object, i.e. the smartphone, to resist and abolish new and old modes of slavery that I shall outline in this talk. I'm also here to sell the book. <laughs> All proceeds you know, I earn you know, uh, from the sales will be donated to an NGO working in the Congo to improve labor rights and environmental justice there, while trying to eliminate the so-called blood minerals in all our smart devices. So with your purchase, you will have more than just a couple of provocative ideas. It will be a contribution to international solidarity too. This is my rundown today. I will start with a brief introduction on what is slavery in the 21st century, which I shall apply to conditions of digital capitalism from the assembly line to the data mine. Then I will briefly introduce two basic modes of ice slavery. On the one hand, there is manufacturing ice slave, such as Chinese migrant workers at Foxconn, the world's largest electronics producer, known for its notorious sweatshop conditions. Comparably, you know, comparable, arguably, to the transatlantic triangular trade. On the other hand, there is manufactured the, or the consumption mode of ice slavery, such as Facebook free labor and people who are addicted to digital gadgets. Next. The main chunk of my talk will discuss anti-slavery struggles and openings for digital abolition through collective resistance, creative memes, and social media on the picket line, 
which can be observed abundantly in the Chinese factory zones and online. The goal is to illustrate, is to illuminate hope for our collective digital future. And I will conclude by sharing eight tips on what shall we do to start abolishing slavery in our smartphones. But first, let me confess, I was an eye slave probably before most people in this room. In the 1980s, as a young teenager, I was addicted to this Apple II game on the left. It's called Load Runner. In the 1990s, when I was a student in Beijing, I wore an Apple pin, as you see in the middle, on the outside of my sweater for an entire winter. I was proud. I was, you know, having an Apple pin. Ten years ago, when my wife gave me an eye touch as a birthday gift, I was so happy that I still remember my excitement vividly. I was, indeed, as com complacent in what I am about to crit critique as every eye gadget user in this room. Frankly speaking, to arrive at the theme of slavery now is a completely unexpected journey for myself. Yet, I'm here now presenting this unlikely and possibly unpopular idea because I am trained a social scientist. I see great utility in connecting slavery with things digital. To me, slavery is much more than a past condition or a provocative metaphor for contemporary reality. It is, more precisely, a comparative method that rehistoricizes our thinking about digital media and labor, China and the world. This is crucial because I'm happy to possess too many scattered empirical observations from my work on Foxconn since 2010, for which I need a larger and more coherent analytical framework. Because studies of digital media in China have suffered increasingly from methodological nationalism or Chinese exceptionalism. Yet, with this comparative slavery framework, we can reconnect China with world history, reconstruct transatlantic and transpacific struggles as one continuous long durée process. This conceptual enlargement can be a theoretical breakthrough that allows us to conceive industrializing regions of China as the backbone of digital capitalism through an old school materialist, yet global approach. Back to the theme of this conference, slavery can be construed simply as the reduction of human subjects into inhuman objects, an ultimate form of objectification and alienation indeed, a process always accompanied by resistance and, uh, and recalcitrance. In a slightly more complex way, this is how I borrow from the scholarship of history, sociology, anthropology, and legal studies to define slavery in the modern era. First, at the bottom, there are two deep foundations for enslavement, one being capitalist modernity, the other, the capacity of slave regimes to mutate over time. Slavery is surprisingly resilient. It transforms as capitalism takes on new forms. Standing on the quicksand of capitalist modernity, the immediate and tangible foundation for slavery is geopolitics, by which I mean the political, economic, and military complex of empire expanding oceans and continents now into the new world of cyberspace, smart device, and big data. Slavery has two pillars, alienation, or more precisely, NATO alienation, as Orlando Patterson puts it, is one pillar. The other is resistance by the enslaved, whose revolutionary spirits inspire us to reimagine a better digital economy, a more humane world. The ultimate goal of slavery is to exploit the body or body parts of the enslaved under conditions of abnormal labor-capital relationship. 
In order to reach this goal, surplus value from alienated body, alienated labor has to be extracted from processes of consumption dominated by hegemonic cultures of consumerism, now coded in corporate algorithms, the latest instruments of enslavement through the manipulation of social media platforms. Finally, borrowing from legal scholarship, these are the arrows on the side, especially you know, if we look at the 2012 Bellagio Harvard guidelines on the legal parameters of slavery, I define I slavery as de facto conditions instead of de jure status. If, quote unquote, powers attached to ownership, this is the legal language to define slavery, any power uh, attached to ownership is found to exist, such as possession, transfer, or disposal, then it suffices as institutions or practices similar to slavery. The first global regime of modern slavery, as I shall submit in this book, is the 17th century transatlantic system. Although there were Africans being tra trafficked uh, to the Caribbean in the 16th century, it was only in the 17th century when the racial structure, the mode of production and transcontinental trade centered on sugar became uh, stabilized. This regime expanded tremendously in the 18th century until the demise you know, in the 19th century. While we have on the one hand this system called 17th century slavery, on the other hand we have slavery in the 21st century. Since year 2000, the International Criminal Court in The Hague and the High Court of, of, of Australia have both used slavery charges to successfully indict former militia and gang members. In so doing, both courts, okay, in uh, Australia and in The Hague, they disregarded the differences on paper okay, and decided that the criminal offenses constitute slavery in the 21st century, nonetheless, because they looked at de facto conditions as summarized in this diagram. Can we further extend this framework of understanding about modern slavery into the world of digital media and smartphones? Let me make three conceptual clarifications. The type of slavery I'm critiquing here differs from the slave society in classic Marxist theory by which Marx and Engels understood as an archaic mode of production that took place before feudalism. In its present shape, 21st century slavery is a techno-social novelty. In another word, I slavery in this current shape never existed before. Meanwhile, from historical studies, we know that slave Slaves are not just poor laborers toiling in plantations or factories. There is also a high class category of what Patterson would call the ultimate slave, such as famili familia Caesaris, pardon my Latin, right? And these are the so-called families of Caesar who serve as surrogates of the empire. They could be extremely wealthy and powerful. They could even own they could even own free men as their servants. Okay? But they could be executed without legal procedure whenever the emperor disliked them. In the past, the ultimate slave also had rebelled, turning themselves into kings and queens. For, for uh, instance, when Turkish slaves founded Mamluk kingdoms in the medieval Egypt, because these surrogates had become the sole means of communication for the emperor. And therefore, the control of communication is power. This is what Patterson wrote. Sublation of the relationship between, immediately became a possibility when slave master intersubjectivity was subverted, first in thinking and in the realm of symbolic interaction, then in the real world of uh, you know, in, a, in a real world of uh, politics, socially and institutionally. Third, the notion of I slavery is not racially defined in that over and again, we have learned this lesson from history. 
interracial resurrection of the quote-unquote motley crew often serves as arguably the most formidable form of anti-slavery struggle. For this, I'd submit that an effective glo global uh, movement of uh, digital abolition, uh, you know, an effective class struggle at, on a global scale indeed, can only succeed when it transcends identity politics, when the enslaved form solidarity on the basis of their common exploitation rather than the color of their skin. So this is my main thesis. Digital capitalism revives slavery, but it also spurs new anti-slavery movements that hold the premise of emancipation. Developing this thesis, we possess a conceptual lens that opens new vistas and brings in fresh thinking. It enables us to travel back and forth between the 17th and the 21st centuries. You may therefore enjoy my little book not only as another volume to read, but also a time machine that enables time traveling. More specifically, this is how I summarize my comparative exercise as three models of triangular exchange. On the left is 17th century Atlantic trans Atl tri uh, triangular trade among Europe, West Africa, and the New World. This audience probably doesn't need me to belabor the model because this is a classic formation based on the flow of African slaves, sugar, and money. At the bottom is 21st century eye slavery. Here, Apple is singled out due to its close affinity with Foxconn, but it's not just Apple. Other major gadget brands, okay, they, many of them use Foxconn as well, right? And uh, other uh, contractors, you know, similar to Foxconn also are, you know, uh, in this system. Structurally speaking, the Apple-Foxconn relationship, sometimes I call it AppCom, is comparable to the Europe-West Africa exchange four centuries ago. Together, they expand to the new world of digital consumption and social media, where UGC, user-generated content, is extracted as the new sugar, so to speak. It's addictive. On the right is a new model of anti-slavery exchange, which I am observing you know, now in greater China. Okay, there could be other models elsewhere in the world I'm not aware of, okay, including in this country, probably. But here we see organized network labor functions as a third pillar of network society, forming dialectic relationship with network enterprise and network states. The cultural capital and social innovations of network labor materializes through working class ICTs, which are used to create collective and activism-oriented WGC, worker-generated content. WGC converge in the working class public spheres that lead to DNA, digitally networked action, which produces new meanings and a new praxis for network labor, thereby contributing to an alternative circuit of anti-slavery, regionally and globally. The rest of my talk is to first compare the two circles of objectification, commodification, and capitalist accumulation on the left and the bottom, in the bottom. And then to zoom into the circle on the right, which is but one model of re-subjectification, re-humanization, and socialist, even communist accumulation toward genuine, sustainable, and systemic change. These are the two modes of eye slavery. Okay, first is manufacturing or production mode of eye uh, 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 slave on the left, uh, on the one hand, and the manufactured or consumption mode con uh, slavery on the other. In the manufacturing domain, the story starts in the bowels of the earth in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where blood minerals such as coltan are extracted by miners, including child labor, who are under warlords' control, sometimes even under gunpoint. These minerals are essential to the electronic components in our smartphones, 
and these smart uh, these components are assembled in massive factories such as Foxconn. This is how it looks like from inside. A company of 1.4 million workers, an army that is at one point more numerous in number than all the armed forces of the US military combined. The book contains accounts of my encounter, you know, multiple encounters with violent Foxconn guards and survey findings about workers being brutalized in this space, which I won't have time to detail today, but you can read about them in the book. To give you a visual impression about how I use uh, historical slavery to shed light on what I see today in Foxconn is on the right hand, you see how a Foxconn dormitory looked like okay, inside. There could be 300 workers sleeping on three level bunker beds in one huge room without air conditioning in the tropical area, re region of South China. According to a worker living in here, quote, the odor of sweat and dirty feet was suffocating. This reminds us of the lower deck of the slave ship in the middle passage going from West Africa to the Caribbean when African bodies were being packed together, suffocated in the packed space with extremely poor ventilation. Another parallel is the transfer of laboring bodies who are unfree and cannot escape. The auction of African or African-American slaves is on the left. On the right, you see the so-called student interns, quote unquote, sent by vocational schools in the hinterlands of China to Foxconn. These are usually youngsters in their late teens. Without working at Foxconn for three months, they simply could not graduate. At school, they major in accounting English pharmaceutics. At Foxconn, they're assigned to the most tedious of assembly line work, making iPhone back cases. Even maybe the one you have in your pocket right now. As their line leaders told me in interviews, each day they had to stand for 10 hours, these young students, okay? They have to stand for 10 hours for making iPhone cases. In the first week, all the female students would break down in tears because of the pain in their, in their legs. In the second week, all boys, all the you know, uh, young males would cry due to the excruciating pain. Yet, they could not leave because otherwise they won't be able to receive their graduation diplomas. Both the schools and the factory benefit handsomely from this transfer of enslaved bodies. Remember, transfer is one feature for uh, you know, uh, slavery uh, regimes. What happens if a worker gets sick due to vocational diseases like leukemia? What about cases of work injury when the employee could not work any longer? Will the factory take care of them as required by Chinese labor law? No, this book contains several sad stories of workers being disposed of, which is, in essence, not too different from the discarding of African bodies when they become liabilities during the Atlantic trade. The most horrifying tragedies took place in 2010 when 15 Foxconn workers jumped to death from tall buildings within six months. Never before had such a theory of suicide been recorded in the history of industrial capitalism. However, if we go back to transatlantic trade, as we could find a surprising similar device of labor discipline and social control against attempts of the enslaved population from taking their own lives, the notorious anti-jumping nets. According to Olaudach Aquiano, a slave boy who survived the Middle Passage in the mid-1700s, he witnessed the jumping of his fellow Africans through these nettings because they wished to die and free themselves from the miseries of enslavement. At the time, anti-jumping nets were a standard equipment for slave ships in the Atlantic trade. 
These nets became obsolete since the abolition of transatlantic trade in the 19th century. But in 2010, they reappeared on top of Foxconn buildings as depicted on the right. There are three levels of nettings. On the top, sky net. At the bottom, ground net. And all windows and corridors are sealed with middle net. Foxconn claimed to have taken down the anti-jumping nets in 2011. And China's media censorship means we do not have a full account of suicide in Foxconn since 2010. However, the suicide has continued. Three years ago, Xu Lizhi, now a famous worker poet in Chinese literary scene, leaped to death in Foxconn, Shenzhen of South China. Last summer, in Zhengzhou, central China, where most of the latest iPhones are made, we still have reliable sources about worker leaping to death in uh, August last year after assembling iPhone 7s. I don't know how many people have iPhone 7s now, right? But, uh, so, uh, and also here in Foxconn Shenzhen in central China, we still saw anti-jumping nets in the dormitory buildings as captured in this photo. So to sum up this part, there are many parallels between electronic sweatshops of the 21st century and 17th century slavery of the Atlantic system, seen through a global and launch durée perspective. The culprit here is not a single company or a single country. It's not just Apple, Foxconn, not just China. It is rather Appcom, this new world system for not only gadgets manufacturing, but also NATO alienation, objectification, enslavement, transfer of unfree bodies, disposal of quote-unquote useless labor, and the anti-jumping nets. We turn next to the manufactured or consumption mode of slavery. This part starts with the real story of a Chinese teenager from a working class family who sold one of his kidneys in order to buy an iPhone and an iPad in 2011. This was an extreme case of voluntary servitude, a very sad tragedy of human subjects being deprived of his soul. Why on earth would someone be so fanatic that he traded his health for the gizmos? He did it because of peer pressure. Why then were there so many devoted fans adoring their eye devices in such maniatic ways? The historical comparison here is with the addictive substance of the Atlantic system again, centuries ago, including tobacco and alcohol. But the real driving force for 17th century transatlantic trade was sugar and rum, okay, the byproduct of sugar production was a popular form of uh, you know, intoxication back then. Today, we have the functional equivalents in our smartphones, Facebook, Candy Crush, or in the Chinese context, WeChat, the equivalents uh, in the most popular social media now. The result of addiction is not just about hardware or software, but about a fundamental shift in our lifestyle towards desocialized eating. Okay, this is what Sydney means called you know, long time ago, this individualization of regularized consumption when we are taken out of the social context and uh, you know, depoliticized. And, and the, uh, but the, the most crucial revelation from this comparison is this. Historically, the increase of slave production in the new world had to be accompanied by the rise of consumption in the old world, Europe, UK included. Hegemonic consumerist culture is key to the domination of Epcom. When system-generated consumption markets serve as a pillar of the new world system that is, indispensable, that is as indispensable as production apparatus. A stronger addictive substance comes from the games, social media platforms, as much as it was for those who are addicted to sugar, alcohol, and tobacco. We lost our freedom when we become addicts. Another angle to assess addiction is to look at how much time 
APCOM regime has been able to extract from us. Time is, as uh, Fuchs showed yesterday, a key dimension for Marxist analysis of exploitation. For Marx, capitalist accumulation of surplus value is ultimately about the acquisition of socially necessary labor time, either through extending work hours or through the intensification of production processes. According to Robin Blackburn, all the slaves under the control of the British Empire you know, back in year 1800 contributed 2.5 hours of labor time that year, mostly by working in sugar fields and associated factories. If we apply the same calculation to Foxconn, by my measure, okay, this modern factory of digital gadgets extract, extracts 2.8 million hours of labor time in China in 2014. That is approximately two British empires. How much time has Facebook extracted from us? This is my conservative evalu uh, as estimation for 2014 using only the total number of daily active users, not weekly okay, or monthly. This result is a little mind boggling. Okay? The total is about 253 billion hours. That is 261 British empires or 137 Foxconns. Compared to Western countries like the UK, okay, the situation I would argue in this book okay, about digital addiction is even much worse you know, in global south, as can be seen in this image from Chongqing, southwest China. Okay, this is the so-called first okay, uh, mobile phone sidewalk you know, in China. So you could see people can walk now without looking at the other side, without worrying about bumping into people. So this is one way, all right? So there's a special, I call it a smartphone lane, okay? So that people can literally, so this became, a, it's, it's having an impact on the landscape, okay, of the, of the city, okay? And this is an instance of self-valorized digital media being more invasive in the urban landscape of the global south, okay? Which in an extreme way echoes Judy Wedgman's sharp critique the I word is practically an intoxicant. This is in her book, Pressed for Time. One way to recover our humanity, as Wedgman continues to contend, is to restore our, quote unquote, temporal sovereignty, to use the same digital tools as instruments of anti-slavery to recover our subjectivities. Indeed, with the darkening of sky, we see brighter stars of hope. This is the real focus of my talk today. Slavery is not the end of the world. We are saying goodbye to it. Okay? Slavery is a fresh start for the constant struggle of human species to regain our subjectivities and intersubjectivities, a broad class struggle toward liberty, liberty for all working people and their families who now have their own digital device. Among historians, there are two strands of thought about anti-slavery. One emphasizes abolition by the elite, the educated, lawyers, religious groups, the middle class, including white saviors from the top down. The other is to see through the eyes of the oppressed, African and Afro-American, the indigenous people, of Australia, for example, the women, the illiterate, the black Jacobins, who resist the powers that be at the grassroots level and from the bottom up. While I am an abolitionist, my work uh, my, uh, you know, leans more towards the second strands uh, of, of resistance. Most importantly, there are three insights that throw light on my analysis from history. First, slavery takes, uh, anti-slavery takes many forms. Seeing, dancing, stealing, sabotage, hunger strike, suicide. The list goes on. Second, slavery and anti-slavery accommodation and resistance coexist in global and regional context. Third, bloody confrontation 
are exceptional. More common forms of resistance was in culture, in daily work and life, and in the constant process of subject making, unmaking, and remaking. With these historical patterns in mind, we of course need to admit that China today is also unique, especially the central part played by the Chinese state in molding AFCON, uh, in molding APCOM through the provision of cheap labor, land, and world-class infrastructure. Another factor, a geopolitical one, is Beijing's attempt to fold in Taiwanese capital. Foxconn is Taiwanese. Okay? They want to be folded in in order to achieve Beijing's goal of reunifying okay, the great Chinese nation. Right? With this, local state agencies in the form of city governments competing with each other in their endeavor to win corporate favor stands out above and beyond the conventional power centers of Beijing, ex uh, extending deep into the country. Hence, the Chinese state, be it national or subnational, remains a key arena for social struggle and power contestation. Which means, importantly, that APCOM is not invisible if state authorities can be pressurized into carrying out its basic duties, a fact that is often better understood among Chinese workers than among intellectuals. Another key condition in China today is the wide diffusion of internet and the rise of what I call the information have less. People in the vast gray zone between the haves and the have nots. Okay, these are people who have less income, less resources. But at the same time, they also have less commitment to the status quo. Therefore, more motivation to, uh, to, uh, to, to start real change. This is a, um, a data visualization about you know, how the Chinese internet user population look like. Back to, uh, you know, I don't know if you already can, can see. Uh, 20 years ago, most of the Chinese internet users were college educated, all right? And then almost half, okay, became working class, you know, in 2003. 2008, okay, the, the college education, you know, is, uh, educated internet users is only a quarter. And now, the, is, is even less, all right? So if we look at this official statistics, okay, that actually almost nine out of 10 internet users in China do not have uh, you know, college education. Okay? So they are working class people, right? Or farmers, okay? Uh, you know, uh, and if we look at the latest statistics you know, from earlier this year, 60% of Chinese internet users earn no more than 334 pounds each month, which is uh, only half the national average of uh, city residents in China, okay? Half of the, their income, okay, the, the, of, the, of the average. So this shows how much internet users, unlike in the global north, uh, you know, in, it, it, you assume the, the internet users are at least middle class, but in a country like China, okay, internet users are working class, okay? Most of them are, uh, you know, extremely working class, right? And if you look at the size, okay, so this is uh, my way to present, okay, that's the national population on the right, okay? In the future, the, the trend is that the Chinese internet user will be even more working class, okay, not less. And a, a third condition of uh, Chinese reality today is about worker resistance, okay? This is the last time we have Official statistics from Beijing, okay, this is in 2011. You know, there were 180,000 mass incidents. This is how Beijing calls them around the country, okay, which is a lot higher than before. And roughly one third of this figure, that is 60,000 labor unrest every year. Okay, every day there are literally hundreds of worker unrest. Digital media is both at the center and the edge of this social mainstream. 
Okay? Some of them we can see through social media, but then there are many others that we cannot see because workers actually also chose. They know they are being spied on you know, through social media, so they also okay, chose not to use in, you know, social media in, in some cases. Right? And so here, with this massive okay, uh, uh, scale of uh, so social unrest, we also see the rise of WGC, the worker-generated content produced by individuals or groups of workers. And they are, th this is a genre of digital content that articulates the voices of the enslaved in order to mobilize fellow workers, appeal to the general public, and or create, uh, creates pressure on the powers that be. I'm getting a sign, I need to uh, fast, fast uh, forward. But here you get, uh, this is uh, Weibo, this is like the Twitter broadcast of a, a worker protests okay, in the town next to Hong Kong. I'm not going to explain. This is my collection of Foxconn worker videos. Okay? They're of different kinds, but they are using smartphones to make uh, videos, uh, uh, sometimes for collective uh, you know, movements. And in the book, I gave a little uh, three-phase uh, history about working class social media in China since 2004. Okay, this, we already have a 13 year history for the evolution you know, of different stage of worker movement and different uh, uh, technological platforms. Right? When, when workers take charge, okay, these are not platforms owned by capitalists, okay, but then the workers actively use and uh, reshape the, those platforms. And a uh, quick snapshot, this is my favorite snapshot, I call it feminine solidarity. You know, on a uh, Honda uh, factory in China, you can see the uh, female workers are using mobile phone as a way to deter the probably most likely male guards, you know, in front of them from using, okay, uh, brutal uh, suppression. And the next is a Maoist forum, okay. China still have Maoist, okay. And it's, they, are, they are among the first to be banned online in China, okay? But the Western media are not reporting. They are only re reporting on the liberal, neoliberal, okay, freedom, you know, website being banned. But when Maoist websites are being banned, you know, uh, they turn a blind eye. And this is uh, poetry, okay? As, uh, and I translated it, you know, uh, and it's a, it's a worker movement in the world's largest shoe factory, 48 thousand workers joined this uh, movement. And they use a poetry, and it's also called, you know, uh, here it says, Da uh, uh, Bao. okay? So that you can see the Maoist, okay, uh, big letter, big character uh, poster, okay? So this is literally called uh, uh, Maoist, okay, uh, political uh, propaganda, all right? And uh, uh, um, weapon. And there's a typology I won't have time to explain here, but each dot here is one instance of WGC. Okay? So if we go beyond that black box of UGC, there are actually many uh, possibilities okay, for us to reconsider uh, uh, working class subjectivity in the cyberspace, as much as I can see in, uh, in, the, in the Chinese okay, um, uh, world I, I'm working on. So there are many uh, possibilities okay, beyond uh, uh, UGC. But here I want to say this is uh, comparable to African singing and dancing during the Middle Passage. Okay? When, if you are an unacquainted observer, okay, then all this African singing and dancing may appear to be meaningless and chaotic. But if you are an insider, of the enslaved population. It can be immensely spiritual and poetic, gratifying and powerful, defiant and fun. My last snapshot here, okay, is what I call the first cyber ambush, cyber war ambush by the Chinese workers against financial industry complex. Okay, it's a shoe factory called 368. The company was going uh, public on New York Stock Exchange, and of course, before you go public, you want to become lean and mean and lay off workers. Okay, so that point there was a, a worker uprising, and uh, but then the local government suppressed it brutally. So what the workers did, shoe factory workers did, was to form solidarity with hackers who did search engine uh, optimization. 
if you know what that is. That, that means when all the New York Stock Exchange investors searched the name 368 you know, factory, they did not see their you know, corporate uh, PR. They see all the bloody pictures of suppression. Okay, so this was the first time, as far as, as, far as I can know, uh, you know, uh, Chinese workers are having alliance, you know, with Chinese hackers. And, um, uh, okay, I'm going to skip this one, okay, in, in light of time. So impressive, as what uh, I have just shown, these are all very impressive, okay, attempts to rebel and, uh, you know, to uh, uh, fight against the slavery. But this acts of social media on the picket line that I just fast uh, th forward through, these are still less remarkable if we compare to the revolutionary Atlantic as recorded in this book, The Man Many-Headed Hydra. Okay? And if we look at the memes of abolitionist society from more than 200 years ago, for example, this famous uh, you know, uh, Joshua Wedgwood Battalion, okay, which okay, I, call, I think is a materialist move, meme. Okay? It moved and reproduced in various material forms, okay, from the medallion, the original form, to fine porcelain, to watches, okay, gold pins that London upper class ladies would wear, you know, when they go to parties to socialize. Okay? So if we look at the meme that I started my book, is this is the meme for the Ice Slave campaign in 2010, this meme still needs to travel further, okay, if we compare this uh, this uh, virtual meme to this historical meme that you can, you can find in museums here in this country. So there are still many things we should learn you know, from history. And uh, another example is uh, in the Netherlands, it's called the Fairphone, okay? And uh, uh, I own a Fairphone, okay? I want to encourage everyone to look into it. But then there is this earlier historical concept in abolition movement called the free produce store, okay? I think the Fairphone still has a long way to go to achieve what the free produce store has achieved in the 18th century, in the 19th century. There's a, a phone story, a, a game, okay? It was so good that Apple App Store banned it, okay? Corporate censorship, okay? But if you have a, a Android phone, you can still download it, okay? I don't have time to explain, but this is, uh, this, this is, uh, uh, platform co-op experiment in Hong Kong that my team have followed for more than a year. And last week, it just went live. So I downloaded it onto my Fairphone yesterday, okay? It's, uh, it started by a group of single mothers, working class single mothers, okay, who try to help each other. But now, uh, you know, if you're in Hong Kong, you put in your home address, they can give you, you know, services in the local community, okay, in a co-op way, using algorithm. Okay, this is working class algorithm, you know, uh, uh, a, a new example. The latest one, and please don't take picture now, okay, because I only got permission from the group SACOM to show this. This is the next SACOM campaign to, okay, uh, let the world remember iPhone in this 10 year. This year is the 10th year anniversary. This is their working logo for that campaign so that we don't forget about uh, the slavery, okay, that's going on, and uh, we don't want another 10 bloody years of uh, eye slavery. So this is the main message I hope everyone can take away today, which is about historical continuity despite the racial subjectivity, specificity of African or, Afri uh, or Afro-American versus Chinese labor. Yes, the two enslaved groups are oceans apart and centuries away from each other. Yes, there was a gender shift from male to female as the most quintessential of the enslaved body. But they are both in shackles, objectified and exploited, weighed down by the capitalist world system and the colonial masters, old and new. It is this subjugation, alienation, objectification, and violent suppression that, consist, uh, that cons constitute their strongest bond across racial categories, across national boundaries, across history. At this point, it should be amply clear that digital media remains in the shadow of slavery, now cast from China and Congo to the new world of APCOM and digital media. It is therefore imperative to imagine an alternative smartphone system. 
and to help this alternative system actualize. To this goal, we need a more holistic concept of digital labor. It is imperative to see through digital capitalism to understand the worsening of contemporary labor conditions along the assembly line and inside the data mine as anything but coincidental. Chinese workers, hackers, and activists have much to learn from the Atlantic theater of African resistance and lessons of American abolition. Um, one of these lessons is the centrality of cultural resistance. When objectified labor joined the anti-slavery struggle through processes of resubjectification, when consumer advocacy can play a central role in reclaiming our intersubjectivities in the production of consumption in, in, in the production or consumption mode, converging in the creation of new revolutionary subjects. The other lesson is that there was, uh, and this lesson is an immensely empowering revelation. That is, historical slavery, despite its formidable appearance, has been and will be defeated if we know how it works. We started today with a note on the resilience of slave regimes under conditions of pre-capitalist and capitalism itself. Let me end with a different note, that is, Forces of anti-slavery and efforts to recover our collective humanity is even more resilient. If we look back on how abolitionists have succeeded in the past against all odds, if we can indeed imagine an alternative post-capitalist world, the most powerful global slave regime, by my understanding, was probably in the, 18, in the 1780s, with its truly immense military, political, cultural, and religious resources. Today's digital data capitalism, or 21st century eye slavery, is not even close compared to this you know, powerful global regime of uh, slavery in the 1780s. However, within one generation's time, the house of cards started to crumble towards the end of the 1700s. And the first, this is the world's first modern anti-slavery legislation was passed in 1807. And it was passed here in London, in the palace of Westminster, within walking distance from here. Bearing this historical note in mind, we really have no reason to despair and feel hopeless. We indeed shall act together with confidence and our collective optimism of the will. This may still sound vague. What exactly can be done? Let me wrap up with my eight tips. If, like me, you consider yourself a smartphone abolitionist, then you can take these eight uh, tips as eight challenges as well. I, by the way, uh, have already succeeded in doing all this and the question is, can you? First, turn off your phone when you go to sleep in the evening, or when you don't use it, okay? And enjoy some peace, okay? If you still remember Douglas Rushkoff's, okay, 2013 book, Program or Be Programmed, the first you know, thing, principle is to turn your phone off, okay? When you are sleeping, it's still, okay, uh, using the big cloud, the, the, the clouds, okay? And, uh, and you may be waked up, you know, by the phone in the evening. This is the easiest one. Turn it off when you don't use it. Don't become its slave, right? And second, minimize your digital garbage, especially in the cloud. Don't take too many selfies if you're not going to look at them in the future, okay? But that will mean, you know, uh, more environmental, okay, uh, uh, you know, um, carbon, okay, uh, you know, footprints, okay, of the cloud. So do that. Be economic when you create digital content. Third one is a little hard for me, okay, when I started to say I want to do this, is to walk away from digital gadgets, okay, because I told myself I'm studying Apple, so I used to spend lots of time looking at the rumor about the next iPhone, or I go to, into the shops to check them, but then I 
I, I, uh, so I gave myself a New Year challenge. Okay, saying I'm not going to pay any attention to to this uh, commercial, you know, uh, enterprises. I'm not going to be walking physically into any shop for a whole year. You know, initially I feel a little hard, but then actually I feel I have much more time. I have more freedom. I can read all the hi history book about slavery and anti-slavery. All right, so this is doable. And the fourth one is to spread word about Congolese miners and Foxconn workers. Okay, you can read about them. There are uh, documentaries. I made one of the documentaries called Decon "Deconstruct Foxconn." Okay, and uh, this is something uh, that everyone can do to follow the call from uh, Franz Newman from uh, yesterday. Okay, it's, uh, uh, Christian's talk. And the next one is to download and play the phone story game. Okay, if you have an uh, Android phone, all right. I actually used it in my class to let my undergrad student play that game, and they, they found it educational as well. And next is to get a Fairphone 2 where your, when your current phone is wearing down. I have my Fairphone 2. If you want to look at it, I can show you. Okay. So get a different phone with the fair trade idea behind it. Talk to IT programmers and designers. Do some ethnography in the slave ship of 21st century. By that, I mean Google, Apple, you name it. And the last one is to start your own movement. Can be labor, environmental, gender, race, you know, you name it, you know, racial equality. And you want to do it in London or anywhere you come from, okay, in the UK or Europe, on your own campus. Last month I was on the campus of University of Sydney. Uh, uh, Kurt uh, Ivison, a geographer, who also happened to be the union leader on that campus, okay, uh, he told me he, uh, did a class, okay, uh, he, he took his student to look at the uh, internet infrastructure of University of Sydney. And then it turns out, okay, half of the traffic on that campus was consumed by surveillance camera. If you complain your campus uh, the network is not fast enough, shut, maybe not shut it down, but actually reduce that traffic, okay? That there's a point of pressure Everyone, if you belong to a university research institute where we can all start, there's always, because, because digital uh, slavery is everywhere, so there's anywhere you go, there are points of pressure that we can start. So with this, I want to uh, conclude and thank everyone. Thank you.